me, who's Anne? I said, uh, I think we better pray first. So we, now our eyes were big, because whenever I say we got to pray first, yeah, she, she knows, knows something's coming. Because we've had other things that God's called us to do. Oh, yeah. So we get on our knees together, and we pray. And we get up, and I said, now look. I said, when God called you and me to be husband and wife, we are a team. I said, I'm about to tell you something that's way out there, beyond anything he's ever asked of us or called us to do ever before. I said, if God is in this, I trust that he will show you. Maybe not in the second, but maybe in the days ahead, whatever. Now, there was a little tears in her eyes. I mean, she knew, it wasn't that she was, was like discouraged. She was moved in her heart. Yeah. She knew this was a serious moment. This is big. She said, okay, tell me. So I told the story that I just told you. And she listened. And I was prepared. I didn't know if she would start crying, like weeping, because, you know, we have three children. And my wife is a mama bear of those children. I mean, she makes sure that they have clothing and education and food and everything. And that's wonderful. She's an awesome mom. And I did not know what her reaction would be. She looked me in the eye. And she's a very quiet, gentle person. She's my, she's my opposite. Okay? So I'm on the shyer side. And she said very quietly, this is what God has spoken. So this is what we'll do. And it's almost like, uh, can, can you say that again? I mean, that's what I felt like saying. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I almost fell over yeah. because I was in shock. I was not expecting this is what God has spoken. This is what we'll do. And, and in fact, <clears throat> in a, just even moments later, I was troubled by her faith. And I'll tell you why. Because if it was switched around and she came back to me after such an encounter in the word and in prayer and said, Don, God's telling us to drop what we're doing and go wherever he calls. Would I have said to April, this is what God has spoken to you, and this is what we'll do? I'm just being honest with you. It, it troubled my own, my own faith journey, as, but, but it was also precious and delightful. Let me so, ask you this question, Don. Yeah. So as a pastor, your, your duties mm -hmm. are very clearly defined. Yes. You know what you do from day to day. Yes. You know what you're building towards each week. And then yeah. you have your, your discipleship ministry uh, with that, yes. so you have a full schedule every day. Yes. When you drop that, mm -hmm. you take a step into the unknown. Mm -hmm. It would be one thing if you said, well, we've got these 50 speaking engagements mm -hmm. and these 50 training seminars, yeah. and there's no way else I can <clears throat> fit it in, so I need to quit this and do that full time. Mm -hmm. Were you stepping into a full schedule? No. Or were you step, well, I don't know what we're going to do. We're just going to follow God. We had, we had many things happening globally sure. in, our, in the nonprofit, yes. But uh, those, those invitations were based on, um, on my timing outside of my pastoring. So it was kind of like uh, half and half, sure. but it's never half and half, yeah. you know. So, no, it was, it was not going into something that was all pre-planned yeah. or prepared. See, I can see, I can see, I can see myself doing that. Oh, yeah, look, it's the only way we can get all this done. And, you know, the demands are now time. And so, so let's do that. It'll make yeah. sense. But it wasn't, it wasn't that. No. So that was a step of faith. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, the focus, though, is not on how big our faith was. The focus is on how mighty is God. Oh, sure. Is really, that's the deal. Yeah. Because he's as mighty for you as for me and for all those watching right now, right? He's oh, he mighty. is. Oh, yeah, no question. We ate breakfast, and we determined as we ate breakfast and prayed again, that if we played around with this conviction, even for a moment, even for a day, John, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. just knowing ourselves, that we may have friends or family that we share with and we could get discouraged because of the very things that you asked me about a little bit ago. So people can say, that's crazy. You have three kids. Sure. They're still going through uh, education. You know, who, what do you think you're doing? And so uh, I threw on a suit and tie and went that morning to my boss. And I said, this is what has happened. I told the same story I told you. And I said, so look, uh, this was like November 22, 2016. And I said, look, we're about to close the year out. So I'm going to take these last five or six weeks and tie off properly uh, here because we're an equipping, we're, I'm an equipping kind of pastor. So there's equipping things that we're right in the middle of and also with the area that we're in. And then I said, then I offered to be a volunteer while you're looking for another pastor. But it will be on the basis of as I can because I will be now with the focus that God's given me globally. So the, my boss uh, knelt down and prayed with me, and he said, I believe that God is moving in this. 
I'm very concerned, though I have to be honest with you. And he said, I'm very concerned who's going to provide for you. Sure. He said, is in discipleship your ministry going to pay you uh, something? No. Is it going to, are they going to pay a, a stipend? No. I said, our ministry is a give model. We don't sell anything. So it's just give. Hmm. He said, I have to say, I'm going to register my concern. Who's going to take care of your family? Well, those questions were answered. I'm looking forward to finding out some more of those answers. So when we get back on the other side of this break, I want to ask you, how did things open up when you stepped into the water? I want, to, want you to tell me about how the Jordan yes. just opened up for you. Then we'll talk a little bit about what you're doing now. You've got some books you've written. I yeah. want to find out about them. There's plenty to talk about. This is a story of great faith in a great and a mighty God. And what I'm hoping today is that Don's experience with God will encourage you to have a wonderful, close experience with God of your own. We'll be right back. This is Pearl. When Pearl heard about the Eyes for India initiative, she decided she was going to take matters into her own hands. When Pearl's birthday came around, she invited all of her friends over for a birthday party, and the theme of the party was Eyes for India. She told her friends about the thousands of people in India who couldn't see, and how this critical eye surgery could change their lives. Instead of gifts, Pearl asked that her friends bring donations for this important project. Because of Pearl's influence, seven people are now able to see. Her story inspired our brand new mission kit. It's a box that has everything you need to fundraise your own project for Eyes for India. Whether it's at the front desk of your business, part of your small group, or a special church project, this kit is guaranteed to change lives. We can't wait to hear about all the creative ways you find to make this resource come to life, just like Pearl. Hello, I'm Dr. David DeRose, a specialist in internal medicine and preventive medicine. And I've been surprised over the years in working with patients and studying the medical research literature just how powerful in the life of those that you love. Thanks for joining me for Conversations, where my guest is Pastor Don McClafferty, who moments ago put his toes in the Jordan River. I want to find out what happened to Don when you decided that, said, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to travel to another place to take on a, a, an entirely faith-based volunteer role. What did you experience? I mean, immediately the, the money poured in and the speaking assignments stacked up on top of each other. Or oh, how did it play out? Because wow. this was... This was a step into the unknown. <laughs> yes. Uh, it wasn't quite that exciting. Uh, so <laughs> It I, never is. I mean, it, it was exciting in a different way. Sure. Exciting that, that we didn't have those things happen. So that is exciting also. Yeah, yeah for sure. So, so, so how do you so, see God work this thing out and establish this and confirm, this is really where I want you? Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, people didn't know that we were taking this step. And when they did hear we were taking the, the step, they assumed that our ministry was paying for us. So no, money came in, well, almost nothing came in. And we went into our first month. I mean, it's like going off of a cliff, John. And we have, you know, three kids in school and, uh, you know, all the normal medical things and everything that all families have. And so we had some, some rough months, but then, you know, just really testing our faith. And the other question was, where are we supposed to operate? Sure. And so we, we did this to God. We put our hands up. I like, I, I work with all ages and I like symbolism. So you know, when you put your hands up, it's a message to God. You know, I give up to you. I surrender. Mm, when it's mm-hmm. like this, I'm holding on. I'm holding on to my security and everything. So my wife and I did this to God. We said, we'll live anywhere on the planet where you want us to operate this, this ministry and we'll go. And I'm a little nervous about that, but we said, we will, by, your, by grace, by the grace of Jesus Christ, we will go. So, so slowly but surely, as the months, uh, you know, passed by, God started taking care of us in unusual ways. Sometimes there would be a knock at the door and someone would say, would you, would you like some vegetables? Oh, yes, we would like some vegetables. You get the idea. Yeah. Sometimes there'd be a check in the mail, whatever. But very slowly. And, but God always provided just what we needed for rent, for the basic things. And then one day as we were praying, and this is a whole other story in itself, but one day as we we're praying, he, he made it clear to us that we should go to Alberta, 
Canada. And uh, that's a, a whole adventuresome story. My wife, by the way, does not do well in cold. And so we really asked God, and she asked God, is this really you? And again, through prayer and waiting on him and, and the steps that we've already talked about, testing in the word of God, being vulnerable to the word of God, it became clear, no, he is calling us to go mm -hmm. to Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm. So my wife's the detail person, so she did all the detail work, and I worked with her on that. She made a lovely notebook for both of us as a couple and also our daughter. We had one daughter still living at home, our youngest daughter. And so got that all ready. Everything was in readiness to go to Canada except for one thing. And the one thing left was the most important thing. And that is we had no uh, invitation from Canada, you know, for a special visa for us to go. Not as a visitor, but to live there. Okay. So, so I said, so God, what do we do? So our daughter needed to go into school. It was coming right up to the fall. We are weeks away and still nothing. We call our, our lawyer up in Canada who is overseeing the process, the move process, and all the detail work. And how long will it be? Oh, another five, six months. So we take this back to God. So God, are we supposed to put a hold on this? And as we pray, God says, I have urgency for you to go to Canada. I said, well, God, if you have urgency, then, then, then uh, please bring this in the mail. Nothing, day after day. Now we're just, yeah, again, it's just a couple weeks out of school. I said, God, what do we do? Put your feet in the Jordan. I said, you want me to, uh, you're not asking me to go illegally across. I mean, I'm not going to, that's, that's not right. <laughs> God, almost, I can picture him chuckling. No, not me illegal. Go by faith up to the border of Canada. Without my paperwork? Yes, without my paperwork. So, so we, we put everything into the van. We had to get rid of some things. Everything we possessed into a little truck I could drive. So, I mean, no one's paying for it. So, I mean, I have to drive the, the moving truck. Before, and when I was a paid pastor, people would move me, you know. Uh, we pack, they move. Now I'm, I'm packing and moving. And so, and my wife's driving our, our little van behind us. And we go a thousand miles up to the border. And every day we check our email and with expectation that something will happen. Good. From the lawyer. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Mile after mile. But guess what? On the very morning, we're two miles away, literally, from the border to cross into Canada. Guess what happened? Just guess. Uh, you got an email saying, here's the paperwork, download it and go to the border and we're going to welcome you to Canada. No, hey. nothing happened. Nothing happened. Nothing at all. No, nothing. I'm two miles away. <laughs> oh, I said, so God, home, which we don't even have anymore, home is, to, is a thousand miles behind me and we're two miles away and, and God, there's nothing from the lawyer. I have no legal way to cross. What do I do? And that still small voice of God says, keep putting your foot in the Jordan. I said, so what does that mean? Go to the border and present your papers. But God, I said, this is all, you know, just direct with, with God. God, I said, my wife has lovely notebooks with everything but the one main thing that we have to have. Go, put your feet in the Jordan. So we hop into the trucks and we go, we're going up there. And of course they wave me. They see me in, a, in the big moving truck. They wave me over because this is not going to just be show your passport and come for a visit. So they wave me over. They know I need to have a sit-down visit with the officers. So our little family troops in there. We present our lovely notebooks, and they go through it, and the man is impressed. He says, wow, your wife has done such a wonderful job. I'm starting to sweat a little bit because yeah. I know what's coming. And his, and his brow furrows, and he says, but you are missing something, sir. You don't have your proper paperwork from our government to allow you to move here. You're not visiting, correct? I said, no, we're not visiting. You're moving here, right? Yes, sir. And you don't have it? No, sir. Then follow me. Oh, I thought I was in trouble. And so we follow the officer. He gets up, you know, and, and, we, and, he, and I don't know, are we going to go into some kind of clinker for a while? I mean, I don't know if we're in trouble. I, I don't know. And so he leads us uh, right outside, and he goes right up to the truck. Is this your truck? Yes, sir. How far did you come? A uh, thousand miles. He shakes his head like this. I can tell he's getting ready to tell me something, and I can feel it's not good. Yeah, the, these, it, these people are not paid to have sympathy or compassion. Absolutely. They're he's paid not to paid to apply the law. He's not paid to get me into Canada. He's paid no. to keep me out unless if I have proper documentation. Correct. Absolutely right. And I'm glad you brought that out because <laughs> uh, you'll understand what happens next. He shakes his head and he says, um, Sir, there is absolutely no way, it is impossible for me to get your family into our country. There is no way I can even 
conceive of that you can get into this country with the, the, the paperwork that you have. You're missing the primary document. And he walks away. I mean, that's it. Yeah. Case closed. He walks away. And I literally, you know, we can pray without, you know, m talking out loud. And so I, I, I send up a prayer to God. And it goes like this. It's very simple. Help. God, I need help. Here's my wife. Here's my daughter. And bless their hearts. They're watching him walk away. And I know they're thinking, and we're thinking, are we going back a thousand miles? No. God told us to go here. And do we feel like a fool? Yeah, we feel foolish, but it's what God told us to do. And, and so I said, God, I need you to intervene. I need your help right now. And as soon as I said amen, the officer, and remember this is a silent prayer, the officer spins on a dime and comes like an about face, and he comes marching right back up to me. Strange, because I never said a word out loud. And he says to me a question that a Canadian, my Canadian friends say is never asked by an officer. He says, he leans forward and he says very uh, kindly, what were you hoping that I would do for your family? Officers are not trained to figure out what we are hoping they would do for our family. No. And so I, I, I thought, I don't know if he's a believer or not. And I said, sir, I said, uh, I don't know if you're a believer in God or not, but I said, God has moved us on our heart to come up to Canada and do a special ministry to, to strengthen the family and help families mentor their children to know Jesus and to walk with Jesus. He said, hmm. That's all he said. It couldn't, there's no flicker on his face. I can, don't know if he's a believer or not. Follow me, he says, just like that, curtly. Follow me. So we go back in there. He says, please have a seat. For one hour, he works on it, bless his heart, trying to find out what he already had told me is totally impossible. Two hours he works. Three hours he works. And then he gets another agent and then another agent. So three agents are working or officers are working. And four hours, five hours after five hours, and we were just, we were praying and praying and praying. He says, Mac Lafferty family, please come forward. We come forward. And he has his, our passports there, and he goes, No way. He says, Welcome to Canada. And he found us a way. That's a whole other story, but he found us a way. And then I said, Sir, I said, Again, I don't know. I just dropped my voice. I don't know if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. But I said, may I pray a prayer of thanksgiving right now? Bless his heart. He looks to the left. He looks to the right. And, he, uh, and by the way, that's not the context of going into Canada in that setting. I mean, they, they're not used to having people pray, certainly not out loud. Oh, absolutely. In that Are you yeah. with me oh, there? A hundred percent. So he's nervous. I, mean, I, he, I think he's, I know the very border crossing that, that you're Probably. About. We yeah. won't say it, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> so he's nervous about it. And he says the third time, follow me. So we go out, and I thought, I hope I didn't, like, upset him or something. Yeah. And we go out there, and I said, sir, I said, again, I don't know if you believe that God even is real or not, but God, the living God of heaven and earth, he just worked a miracle through you as an officer here at this border because you had told me that this was impossible, and he found a way. And the man was shaken up, visibly shaken. And he said, what you don't know is the other part of the story. He said, just a few months ago, my wife and I, who have been followers of Jesus Christ, we gave up on our church. We just got discouraged. We gave up on the Lord Jesus Christ. We just said, he doesn't exist. Because he's not intervening in our life, we don't see any evidence of his existence, and we have given up on both, church and God. And he said, today, just seeing that what happened, and he, said, he looked us in the eye, he said, I know personally that I knew of no way to get you in. It was impossible. He said, I know that God lives. And today, as soon as I get off of my shift, I will go home to my wife and I will tell her the story and we will believe together and we will make our home a place of worship. Fantastic. God is able, isn't he? He is. Yeah, um, those border stories, they're doozies. What an amazing experience. You got into Canada, this thing started to go. We don't have too many minutes. So, yes. so, so briefly, and I want to ask you about some books you've written. Yes. Uh, tell me about the kind, of, uh, the kind of training opportunities you've had since that time. Oh, God just worked in such a precious way. Across Alberta and other parts of Canada, uh, God opened the door to start having revivals and then to do discipleship training. And then, of course, we've continued to work around the world uh, as well in every continent except the Antarctica we talked about. Yeah. So God's just moving. And even in, during these days of, of pandemic, 
God still opens the doors for revivals and discipleship training, both online but also in person. Yeah, fantastic. God's yeah. moving. Yeah, you, you know what I wish, and I don't want to sound like a subversive saying this. Mm-hmm. Be careful, do your thing, wear your whatever, keep your distance, whatever, whatever. But there's still a way. Yes, there's always, still a way for a God way. to work. It, yes. it may look different. Yes. It may not be able to do it exactly the same, but there's still a way. The people who've thrown their hands up in the air and said everything's off, can't do nothing, I, I think their God is yeah. far too small. There's a way to get certain things done. And thank God many people have been able to go forward in ministry and, and church and so forth. And we do it respectfully. Oh, 100%. With whatever, yeah. Yeah, we must. You've got to, you've got to respect the context. But, but the idea that doors are shut. No. Uh, I don't think uh, God is the They're God. opening faster than ever. Yeah, amen. Hey, so you wrote some books. Yes. Tell me about those. And, yes. and I won't even ask you why, because I know that writing books <laughs> is a lot of work, but God has given you experiences. You put them on paper. So tell me about them. Yes, and it's a joy to tell you about them because I don't sell them. You don't I only sell give them, them away. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll give them to you. I'll, I'll give them to your ministry. I'll give them to whoever wants them. So, so uh, these are the last five books, and I'll just tell you about them just real quick. One is Follow. Follow. Mm-hmm. Follow is a book about how to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Every chapter is a step to do with Jesus. This is not just for your own devotions, John. Like if I, if I trust you with this, if I give this to you as a gift, it comes with a challenge. Go and read this with somebody that God calls you to disciple. Maybe someone who has a religious experience but doesn't have Jesus as their, as their disciple maker awesome. in their life. Right. Okay, so that's that. Right. This next one, Discipling the New Generations. Our daughter, Julie, and I wrote this together. For four years, we prayed and wrestled with God about how to do this. The first five lessons are for parents and mentors. The last 20 lessons are for parents, mentors, and their children and teens. Nice. Okay? All right. And the next one is Live Like Elijah. This little book is taking the, the powerful lessons of Elijah in the Old Testament and showing that the same God who lived back then, lives just as much today, and just as he provided for Elijah with nothing, it shares the, the last three years of our life how God provided for us in crazy ways. Mm. Like sometimes um, in the snowstorm, we'd have a knock at the door and someone would say, could you use a bushel of, of I know what it was, it was apples. And I said very calmly, even though I, I really needed the food right then, I said very calmly, yes, we could use some apples. I said very politely, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. And as soon as I shut the door with a bushel of apples, I said, April, I said, God has answered our prayers yeah, again amen. and provided. Yeah, <laughs> so amen. just full of stories like that. Yeah, fantastic. Okay? The next one is called Come Home. Come Home. In this time of pandemic, even though we are home more than ever, maybe it's time that we come home with our hearts to what God wants to do in our homes. Because, John, God has vision for our homes, for our families. This book can be used just for you personally. You and your wife could do it together. Uh, You can invite other families together. Either if you're not comfortable doing that uh, in your home, you could do it online. And a small group style, okay? Cool. And then the last one just came out, Schools and Discipleship. Nice. Schools and Discipleship is full of recipes of how a school can work with a home to disciple the kids intentionally. Mm. These little recipes can also be used in lots of other avenues or or venues. He was raised largely in the great state of Alaska. He's been a logger, a commercial fisherman. In fact, it was while he was a commercial fisherman that he sensed God's call in his life. He became a pastor and is today an It Is Written affiliated evangelist. I'm John Bradshaw. He is Pastor Donovan Cack, and this is Our Conversation. Pastor Donovan Kack, welcome to Conversations. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So today, you're a full-time evangelist. Yes, I am. Traveling on the road with your family, sharing the Word of God with people. Mm -hmm. You've been in ministry how long? It's been 26 years. Just just finishing my 26th year. As of today, 26 Mm -hmm. years. All right. But your story goes way back beyond that. I want to talk with you today about evangelism, about soul winning, uh, th- those great stories of people coming to faith in Christ. We'll talk about the Bible, but why don't we go back? Uh, you're from the Pacific Northwest, really. So, so tell me a little bit about how things got started for you, where you spent your, your youth. Um, my dad was a minister, and so I grew up uh, back in that day. We traveled around quite a bit. They 
Every few years, we had moved to a new place. We started in Iowa. I was born there, moved to Wyoming, moved to Oregon, and moved to Washington State. Pretty much the Northwest was our home after that. Yeah, so you followed in your dad's footsteps. You have a brother, Jim, who's a pastor as well. I do. When you were a kid, like, you know, eight, nine, ten years old, did you ever think, I'm going to be a pastor like my dad? I did. I did. You know, it was, uh, I can remember as a boy, I had the absolute best parents that anybody could possibly want. I mean, my, my dad is a minister. You know, sometimes people talk about being a PK. Yeah. To me, it was the absolute best experience possible. My parents lived what they taught, and they put an enthusiasm in our lives for the gospel. I can remember going to Bible meetings at our church, and I can remember coming home from those meetings, and we'd be praying for the people that were coming to the meetings. And, you know, my heroes were, were those evangelists and, the, and John the Baptist and Elijah. And I was like, yeah, I want to be like that when I grow up. You, know? you might have already answered my question, but for parents wondering how to, how to turn their children towards a love for the Bible and a love for ministry, I know you covered it briefly, but talk to me some more about how your parents were able to give you a, a love for the church and a love for faith and a love for ministry when it often doesn't work out that way. Looking back, I think the thing that was big for me, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. I mean, it wasn't, hey, this is one thing that we do when we're here and when we're home, it's a different thing. It was, it was a life and they had a passion for it. And they had a passion for leading people to Jesus Christ and seeing them fall in love with it. And I tell you, it, it was, it's contagious. It really is. And, yeah. I, and looking back on it, that was a massive influence in my life and my, my younger brother as he ended up moving in ministry too. So what is this with the Pacific Northwest? You were born in Iowa, but I mean, every step you took was further from Iowa and closer, <laughs> closer to, to Russia. Uh, and you ended up in Alaska and you've ministered in Alaska and the Dakotas and Montana. You live in Montana now. Tell me about the Pacific Northwest. You must, you must love it out there. I, I, I do love it out there, you know, and we grew up around the mountains, you know, in Wyoming, big time mountains. My grandpa was a, a sawmill man. And uh, so mountains, logging, trees, mountains, it was just, it's a, it was just born in us, you know, yeah. and then my mom's family lived more in the Pacific Northwest. And when my, when my dad's parents retired, they moved out to the Northwest. And so there was a couple things, I think, that kind of were drawing that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I know that somehow you kind of got off, got off the track. Mm -hmm. But before we get into the details, as it were, of that, you ended up logging, which if you live in the Pacific Northwest or you're in Alaska, you, you kind of have to or they boot you out of the country. And you ended up on commercial fishing boats, which isn't terribly rare for somebody <laughs> in, a, in Alaska, but it, it may be a little rare for someone who is planning on getting into ministry full time. How did you end up as a fisherman? Well, at that point, I had no idea ministry was in the cards when I went into logging and commercial fishing. At 16 years old, um, I finished my ninth grade. My older brother had just graduated from high school and... Uh, my uncle was moving to Alaska. He was moving a whole, his low, whole logging operation up there. And uh, so he asked me if I wanted to come along. And uh, I went along. And that summer, uh, we were doing right away logging. And, uh, at 16. At 16. Yeah. And it got in my blood. Yeah. And uh, it was exciting. My older brother stayed in it many years after I did. Right. Right. But it was fun. Yeah. And then somehow you segued to fishing. I did. You know, after, uh, after logging for a while. My parents uh, moved up to Alaska, up near Anchorage. And, uh, and when they went up there, of course, I was really intrigued on what more was in Alaska. And uh, there were some people that lived there that I knew that were commercial fishermen. And uh, my brother and I both went and spent our first summer, and we got hooked. Yeah, hooked. We got hooked. <laughs> yes, literally. Hey, so what's that life like for those of us who've never been near a commercial fishing boat in Alaska? What's it like? Is it tough? Is it cold? Do you work all day, every day? What's it like? Um, the way that it works is this. Typically, uh, commercial fishing season, at least for us as gill netters in Bristol Bay, was from basically from around May to around the end of July. That's pretty much the time. The king salmon come early. Uh, the summers are cool, but you have daylight. And so, yeah. uh, you know, you, you fish. The way that it typically works is they have... Uh, 
government fish people that count the fish when they go up the rivers. And so typically they start by giving you fishing periods. And uh, so you might get to fish one tide and, uh, and then they'll stop and they'll see how much they have going up the river. Yeah, but once they get their escapement up the river, you're on full it's time. On. Yeah. And it's gill nets. And so, you know, we got three shackles about the length of a football field out behind our boat. They go about 12 feet deep and uh, fish get in there. And then you've got hydraulics to pull them in. And then you pick each individual fish has to be picked out of that net. And you load them in, in, uh, into brailers. And then when you fill those big bags, each one has about 2,000 pounds of fish in there. When you get those loaded up, the, there's tenders that anchor up out there where you're fishing. And you go over, you tie up to them, and they got cranes that come down, lift those bags off. It's exciting. Yeah, it is. It is exciting. But by the end of the season, once, you are, uh, once they get there escaping up the river, you're fishing 24 hours a day. And uh, it can get grueling. Yeah, but it, it's fun. Do you recommend that life to, to a kid looking for adventure? Uh, before you get married, it's a good thing. Yeah. After you get married, I would not recommend it. Oh, good. You've yeah. just gone all the time. You're gone too much. Yeah, that's no good. Now, I haven't heard the story, even though I know you've told it around here, but um, circumstances conspired in one way or another to kind of lead you away. They did. What, what happened? You know what? I grew up, uh, my first couple of years, I was homeschooled. Then I went to a Christian school, and, uh, and I loved it. It was a wonderful experience. Growing closer to the Lord. Then we moved to a new area out in the northwest there in Washington, and, uh, and I got involved in a new school, and I was just going into seventh grade. It was much bigger than any school I'd been in before, and they had an intramural sports program that began to turn my life in a whole new direction because I found that I really love sports. And, uh, and to me, it became so exciting that I began to want to play it. If I wasn't playing it, I was practicing it. If I wasn't practicing, I was watching sports. And, uh, and it, it was a subtle journey for me because slowly, in fact, I think it probably wasn't until a year or two later that I began to, it began to dawn on me what was happening. And when my parents would call for family worship, it wasn't nearly as exciting as the game that I had just watched. Right. And, uh, and slowly, my time, personal time in the Bible, began to lessen. And, and along with sports came a different kind of music uh, that was not designed to uh, enhance a relationship with God. Right. Rock and roll became a part of my life. And and it just began to just suck the, the feet right on, underneath from me. Mm. And, uh, and in the midst of this, um, I finished my ninth grade. That school only went to ninth grade. At that, that was the summer that we went to Alaska. And, uh, and when I got up there, I started logging. And, you know, during this whole time, John, I never stopped going to church. Mm -hmm. But I learned something. You can be just as lost in church as you can be doing anything you want to out right. there. And that is exactly what it was for me. I was, I was in the church, but I was not having a relationship with Jesus Christ. So how'd this turn around? Well, you know what? When I was uh, work, just working, logging, commercial fishing, I did some construction, removed asbestos. But uh, it was toward the end of my time. I did four summers commercial fishing. And it was my last summer commercial fishing that partway through that summer, um, we had some of our friends out there. Their boat went down, and the two two crew members drowned. Oh, and uh, you, you knew the crew. I members? knew them, and Ooh, uh, okay. you know, and and uh, at that point, I thought I was never going to die. I was never going to have to face anything like this, and uh, man, that was a wake up call. I remember I heard the news as I was listening to my Walkman. You remember what a Walkman oh, is, John? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, those are the days. <laughs> and uh, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and they were given an update on the fishery. We had, had some really bad, bad weather that night, and the planes were flying over, the C-130 flying over there looking. And, uh, and then the report came on that uh, they found these guys 
the, the captain of the boat had drowned, but he had his survival gear half on, but right. the two crew members didn't make it, and I was just like, uh, I remember taking the Walkman off, I threw it on the top of the anchor, and I said, man, God, if you really are who you say you are, then I gotta stop fooling around. And it was at that moment um, that I went in, and I went down in the cab of the boat, down to where my bunk was, and I reached in and I got my Bible that my mom had made sure that I took with me when I left home. Yeah. And uh, I took it out, and I took it back on the bow of the boat, and I'll tell you what, it was at that moment that I knew that either I was going to be 100% for God, or it wasn't going to be anything. And at that moment, the last thing on my mind was doing what I'm doing now. <laughs> yeah, right. I couldn't have imagined it in a thousand years. So what do you think your parents were doing during this time? And how did they relate to you? Here's their second son who loved family worship and was excited about ministry, but they are seeing you drift. Mm -hmm. how, did they, how did they relate to you during this time? How did they encourage you? Was there haranguing and hectoring, or were they especially patient? Or, or just tell me how they worked with you. You know what? They they absolutely loved me. I never can remember one time them haranguing me about anything. But I can tell you one thing that I know: my mom and my dad were both doing, and I knew it. They didn't have to tell me. They were praying for me, mm. and they were praying big time. And, uh, you know, when you know that your parents are praying for you, whew, man, I'll tell you, that's, that's huge. And, uh, and I believe that uh, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for my mom and dad mm. and their prayers. Mm. Yeah, that's something that all parents need to take on board, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So presumably you got off the boat. You had a new heart. What happened next? Or when did you sense that? God was calling you to, to train for ministry. How'd that come about? Well, you know, even before that season was over, um, a seed was planted in my mind. I didn't recognize it at the time, but uh, they had what they called Fisherman's Church. Okay. You, you just meet on the beach. Sure. And I don't remember who it was that was preaching that day. I can't remember a thing that he preached about except for one thing. And uh, he said something, that, and it grabbed my attention. He goes, we get to do something right here right now in this old wicked sinful world that is good that we'll never get to do in heaven and i was thinking no way you yeah you know, got my you got my attention now. <laughs> yeah i can't imagine anything that that we could do here that's good that we couldn't do there and uh and then he said you'll never be able to lead a lost person to jesus yeah how about that amen and uh i'll tell you over the the coming months following that, I could not get that out of my mind. Really? You know, at that point, my goal, I wanted to get my own boat and permit. Sure. I wanted to commercial fish in the summertime. I'd be able to make enough that pretty much the rest of the year I could do whatever I wanted to do. And uh, all of a sudden, as I began thinking about pursuing that, it felt empty. And then I thought about, well, starting a business and doing this, and it, it just seems so empty. And then when I combined that with losing those guys out there and uh, just realizing how quickly life could be ended. You know, I just began to sense that I wanted to do something that meant, made a difference. Yeah. And, uh, but I knew that uh, ministry wouldn't be it because uh, public speaking scared me to death. And uh, so uh, I decided finally, when I, that conviction wouldn't go away, that uh, I would uh, become a pilot. Okay. And I would fly missionaries around the world. And you became a pilot. And I was working on it. Okay. I took ground school. I went to college, enrolled as an aviation major, took my ground school, started my, ground, my flight training. And it was part, late, part way through my flight training that uh, one morning I got up. I was just spending time in, in my Bible. And it was like, uh, when are you going to do what I want you to do? And I was, I mean, I didn't hear a voice, but the conviction just it hit me, and I go, what do you mean? I loved flying, and, and I thought, man, this is it. And, uh, and at that moment, it just began a thing that would not go away. And that's, I began to really, truly sense a call 
to the gospel ministry. Mm. And it wouldn't leave, John. It just wouldn't go away. Well, I'm glad God called and it wouldn't leave and it wouldn't go away. So you, what did you do? Did you change majors? I did. Yeah, I did. I don't know if I did that year, but I know by the time I hit my sophomore year, I had changed majors to theology. I want to be careful here because I, I, I know a little bit about this, having spoken to you. Uh, I'll leave out the name of the school okay. because that was in a different time. And it's fair to say that the, 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 the theology program at that school has changed. changed. But it was discouraging for you to begin with, if I recall correctly. You're right. I went through my first two years at, uh, at college. The second year, I was intentionally in the theology program. By the time I was through my sophomore year, which was in December, because I was, I was not a normal student, when we hit that time, I went home for Christmas, and it was over that break. I told my dad, I said, you know, I, I thought I felt the call to ministry, but I said, if this is what ministry is about, I've realized that's not for me. What was it? Was it, was it skepticism being, being taught? Or, you know, or what was it? basically, they, they, they were bringing up a lot of questions and creating doubts as to what we believed, and, and they were not answering it. The whole focus of what ministry was about wasn't what I had seen modeled yeah. in my own home. Yeah. And it was just creating all kinds of questions. And I thought, man, if this is really what it, what it is, I really don't think this is it. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a teaching method mm -hmm. that some people ascribe to. I don't. Right. Because I've seen young guys go off to school, different school now, mm -hmm. and, uh, and be told, okay, we're going to dismantle your faith. Mm -hmm. Direct quote. And then we're going to put it back together in the next year. They don't make it to the next year. That's right. That's you know? right. So, so this kind of teaching, it's, it's idiocy, as a matter of fact. I, I, in fact, I think I'm being kind. <laughs> so the good news is you transferred schools. You didn't bail out. You transferred schools. I did. Okay. I did. My, my dad suggested, hey, why don't you try a different school? And so guess what? Two, right. day, two days later. Two days. Without even contacting that university, I got in my pickup and I drove about 1,800 miles to a whole different school. You did. And it began, it was one of the best decisions I made. Fantastic. There have been many good decisions made, and the best decision was made was when Jesus died for you and decided for you. But from there, ministry was born and ministry flourished today. Donovan is an evangelist. We've got much more to talk about. This is Conversations. We'll be right back. You know that at It Is Written, we are serious about the study of the Word of God, and we encourage you to be serious about God's Word also. Well, I want to share with you another way that you can dig deeper into the Word of God, and here it is, itiswritten.study. Go online to itiswritten.study, and you can access the It Is Written Bible Study Guides. 25 in-depth Bible studies that will walk you through the Bible. It's going to be good for you, and it's the sort of thing that you will want to tell somebody else about so that they can dig deeper into the Word of God and come to know the things of the Bible intimately. As you get into the It Is Written online Bible study guides, you'll understand the prophecies of the Bible, the plan of salvation, and more. So don't forget, itiswritten.study. It is written dot study. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm John Bradshaw. Special guest today is Pastor Donovan Cack, who is an It Is Written affiliated evangelist. And we've been talking so far, Donovan, about uh, you know about about your entrance to ministry. You made it to college, changed majors, changed colleges. Somehow you got out of there and into ministry. Tell me what that was like and, and where you ended up. Oh, it was exciting because for, for me, I had my first district was on the same island that I had logged at. Oh, no kidding. On Prince Wells Island up in southeast Alaska. So there you were back, back in town. People yeah, knew you. Back in the same place. That's yeah. right. In All fact, right. some of the guys I'd stayed with in the bunkhouse were still there. Is that right? When we went back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you got a call to Alaska. You, you'd been kind of raised in Alaska. So that was easy, right? That's right. No brainer. Mm -hmm. Okay. What was that like going into your first district? It was intimidating. It was scary. Yeah. Uh, public speaking still scared me to death. I was not called into ministry because public speaking was the thing that was just burning in my heart. No. It was seeing people come to Christ. That was the thing that was burning in my heart. I remember the very first time that I had to get up and, and preach. 
And I was in the back room before you come on the platform. I was so nervous, I felt like I was going to explode. And I actually had to get down on my, you know, and do push-ups to try and get some of that nervous energy out. But uh, man, I'll tell you what, uh, God uh, worked his miracle. He took that away. And uh, then it just became the joy of ministry, pointing people to the greatest hope that we have. Yeah, amen. You know, getting into ministry can be, can be intimidating can. And, and you can kind of take a while to get your legs under you. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was your entrance into ministry like? Did you have supportive people around you? Were you just kind of left to figure it out on your own? And what, what would you remember as the, the challenges? Oh, boy. The challenges were pretty intense. Basically, I ended up on, on an island. I had two different churches. One of them was a logging float camp. When I first got there, it was 96 miles away on logging roads, and uh, I, was, I was there on my own. I had never given a real genuine Bible study. I had never, there was a lot of things that I hadn't done. I hadn't re- run a board meeting. I didn't really know how to do it, so I had to learn. In fact, two weeks into my time there, I remember I met with uh, the church after potluck, and we were sitting around, and, and I asked them, I said, you know, what is it that you would like from me as your new pastor? And, yeah, what'd they uh, say? And they said, well, you know, we want you to teach us how to win our friends to Christ. We really do. And you know, John, I should have been really excited about that, but I'd never done it. I had never led anybody to the Lord. You know, I had the ideas in my mind, but it was intimidating, and, but I couldn't leave it to the pastor anymore. <laughs> right, that's right. You <laughs> and, were the pastor. Uh, that was it. Yeah. And I remember that night, I wasn't married yet. I went back to my trailer, and uh, I'll tell you, I had all kinds of conflicting feelings. I felt like uh, loading my duffel bag and just getting on the ferry and disappearing. I thought, Lord, what am I doing here? And that night, I wrestled. I agonized. And it, it lasted till about 2 o'clock in the morning till I was completely exhausted. And uh, the next morning when I woke up, I'll tell you what, I knew exactly. It was like God just you know, honed it in. So you don't know how to do it. You get out there and you figure it out. <laughs> and you did? And I did. How'd that so, come about? You just, you, you. I, I did. You, you know, when I was. A, a, an invitation or what happened? What happened is when I was in college, when I was going to college the second two years, I started going around and I went, I became involved in going door to door selling Christian literature. Ah, literature evangelism. I did. And, you know, and it was a, it was a powerful preparation for me because I don't know, I don't think I would have stayed in the ministry without it. You know, I have read, I have read, I think this is an exact quote. There is no better training for any line of ministerial work than, than Cole Porter. That's right. Fantastic. It was awesome. So, so I decided I'm going to go around, I'm going to knock on my neighbor's doors and see if I can find somebody to study with because I need to figure out how to. do this so i did i knocked hey i'm donovan i'm your new neighbor just moved in the area wonder if you'd like to study the bible you know not even that super of an approach but guess what it's straightforward by the end of two or three days i had four different families that said yes really and and it began a process for me i remember uh, as i as i began to do bible studies i i really didn't know what i was doing and i remember the first time I was asked a question in one of those studies that I did not know the answer to. And I came away from that Bible study feeling like a complete failure. I mean, like I had just blown it. Uh And I remember I got back home and I called my dad. My dad's a minister, remember? And I said, Dad, I don't know. I think I've just absolutely blown it. I mean, they asked me a simple question I should know the answer to. And now here, I had to tell them I don't know. And they're going to think, man, this is the pastor and he doesn't know? What kind of church is that? You know, And, and, And he said something to me that just completely took uh, all that stress away. And my dad says, hey, if you get asked a question you don't know the answer to, tell him. I don't know. and uh, But tell him, I'll get back with you on it. There you go. And then do it. And uh-huh. he goes, they'll appreciate it. I'll tell you, John, at that point, that's exactly what I did. It took the pressure away, and Bible studies became fun. You know, one of the things that I've discovered, and I've, and I've, I've, I've polled congregations, and, mm-hmm. and you know from same, same reason. Uh, one of the things that keeps people from sharing their faith is they're afraid they don't know all the answers. That's right. Well, who knows all the answers? Don't. <laughs> you know, the seminary professor doesn't have all the answers. That's right. So you just be honest with somebody. Oh, don't know. got me there, but I'll get back to you. That's right. I'll call my dad. <laughs> That's you know, right. <laughs> I'll look online. I'll dig into a book. We don't have to worry about that sort of thing, do we? And then do it. That's yeah, right. That's yeah. right. So what happened there on, 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 on the island in Alaska? Did the church begin to grow? It did. It did begin to grow. And you know what? But 
what happened is was this my uh my boss was very interested in encouraging us to win people to jesus christ right that's why i felt called to ministry in the first place i wanted to see people come to christ it wasn't just about growing the church i wanted to see people getting ready to meet jesus yeah hey i'm and, gonna interrupt so you were in the right place Imagine if you got a call to some other place where there wasn't that sort of yeah. emphasis. You'd have just become just another pastor who chairs board meetings and plays golf. Yeah, I wouldn't be in ministry today. No, no, no. Yeah. No. And so, anyway, uh, I, I got passionate about Bible studies. We were having all kinds of Bible studies going. People in the church were beginning to give Bible studies. And, and I went to some pastor's meetings. And, and my boss, he took me aside at those meetings and he said, Donovan, have you thought about having a public series of evangelistic meetings where people can be led to Christ? And he goes, there's just something powerful about it because they're designed to help people make decisions. Right. And, uh, and I had thought about it because he had talked about it before, but I thought, oh, my church isn't ready. Oh, well, you know, we, we just got to do a lot more work and maybe after a couple more years, we'll get ready. And before I could even get any words out of my mouth, he says, you're ready. You are absolutely ready. And we got up, we walked down the hall. He introduces me to our conference evangelist. And he says, Donovan wants to do meetings. And I'm thinking, I didn't say that. <laughs> uh, he, is, he assumed the sale. He like did. Like a good literature evangelist. He did. And yeah. I'll tell you what, it was exciting because we sat down, we, we set up a date for the meeting. Now I had something to work for and a, a time. And so I went back and talked to the church and uh, they began to work a little more intentionally. And guess what? When he came down and he held a series of meetings and he stood up just with his Bible in his hand, I got riveted mm. personally. Mm. Yeah. And I got excited. And not only that, but our hall was packed. And you got to remember this church was on an island in a little tiny town of Craig, south of, southeast Alaska. And we only had about 20 people coming to church. At the end of that series, we had 11 baptisms. Wow, that's, that's powerful. The church was ignited. Yeah. I knew I was addicted. I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. You could not take me away from that. And I knew that for the rest of my life, evangelistic meetings were going to be a part of the life of any church where yeah. I was going to pastor. That administrator you referenced, Jim Stevens, right? Yes. yes. Still holding meetings today. Still holding meetings. Yeah, still on fire. <laughs> Thank God, still, still, still leading people to That's Jesus. Right. That's right. You know what happens. And something else that he did that was such a big thing for me personally was every month he made a huge investment in us guys that were just new ministers. And he flew all of us up to Anchorage just to spend a whole entire day with us, encouraging us in ministry, letting us ask questions. And to this day, I look back at that as being a huge factor personally mm. Mm. in my, uh, my growth and Evangelism. Yeah, one of the things a lot of church members don't realize, A, many pastors, and I don't mean to throw pastors under the bus with my comment about just another pastor playing golf, because, I mean, right. not that any pastors we fraternize with would be. <laughs> right. but, yeah, nothing, nothing wrong with golf, pastor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, <laughs> so let's quit while we're behind. But a lot of pastors aren't taught in school how to give Bible studies or to conduct evangelistic meetings. Mm -hmm. Some of them aren't encouraged to do it. Some of them are encouraged not to do it. That's right. Many young pastors aren't mentored, like you had the privilege of being mentored by Jim and, and, and encouraged by those around you. So the church members might want to remember that, that we all want our pastor to be like Jesus, and there's not a single one that is. So you were encouraged, you were kind of thrust in the deep end here, uh, how did it impact your church? You said there was an influx of new members. What, what did it do for the members? Because they were asking you, teach us to reach others. Did that work? It worked. It worked. And, you know, it, the church began to grow and grow. It wasn't long after that. In fact, it was one year after that we did our first satellite meeting. Oh, great. Net 96. Yeah. And uh, they by wanted it is written by it is written. Yeah. Yes, indeed. And you know what? They were excited. They were the ones that pushed it. They nice. said, we've got to have this. See what happens. It happens. Yeah. And uh, we had more baptisms from that one. And after Beautiful. that, they were wanted to plan the next one. Great. Hey, you said a moment ago, you believed your church wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, we hear that all the time. I don't know how many ready churches there actually are. We've had uh, myself, I've had meetings that uh, have been postponed or canceled because the church was in turmoil or 
there were problems there and it, and it really wasn't the time. But how often is a church really not ready? You know what? I, as I've gone in and done meetings, uh, the biggest thing is, is that people invite people. Yeah. If they'll invite people, man, I'll tell you, I've, I've watched churches that thought absolutely about calling the meetings off. And then when it's over, they're saying, man, if we would have known it was going to be like this. Oh, man, alive. we're glad we did it. Happens to us all the time. Mm-hmm. If only we'd known. Well, that's, we told you. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> we told you. We told this you works. This. You know, right. God is into this. The typical church doesn't believe it's ready. The mm-hmm. typical. Some churches do. Yeah, we can do this. But how many times? We're not ready. Mm-hmm. So what do you do if you're the pastor of a church or you're the board of a church and it's that typical malaise, we're not ready? What do you do? You know what? I'll just give you a for instance. One of the last churches that I went into pastor, um, it was in the Midwest, and they, uh, it was a small church. We had about 20 people. And anyhow, they were thinking of about things, and I was trying to encourage them toward soul winning, toward evangelism. First of all, I visited all the people and the members and stuff, and, and after we'd been there six months, eight months, I began to talk about doing an evangelistic series, and they were kind of a little bit hesitant, mm. you know, and, mm-hmm. and, uh, and then they began to resist a little bit more. They say, well, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money, and, uh, and our church is in debt. How can we afford to do that right now? And besides, you know, people are entrenched in their churches. There really are, you know, because in the Midwest, a highly uh, religious, you know, Catholic and Lutheran and different ones. And yeah, people put down deep roots, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they put roots wherever they're at. And, yeah. uh, and anyhow, it was, uh, but I, we, we kept trying to encourage them. And there was a resistance. And finally, I remember one night I came home and I said to my wife, I said, you know, they're really, they're really, really kind of resistant to the idea. I said, what could we do? So we prayed about it. And out of that conversation, we came up with an idea. And uh, the next board meeting that we had, um, I, I asked them if they would be open to us even using the building to do a series of meetings. Because they were nervous. They just weren't sure it was going to work. And, uh, and they said, well, yeah, but what about the money? And I said, well, you know what? Uh, my wife and I will take care of whatever we're short of oh, yeah? when the meetings are over. Yeah, And... Uh, well, all the reasons were, were now gone for not doing a series of meetings, and we invited an evangelist to come, Jack Cologne. I don't yeah. know if you know him. Jack's a great evangelist. Yeah, man. good friend of mine. And, yeah. and anyhow, so we set the date, and we were approaching the time, and, and the church members made a few invitations, but some of them wouldn't even commit to coming to the meetings. Really? But when the opening night came, they were kind of curious to see what would happen. And so we had about eight of our church members, eight of the 20 okay. that were actually there. Right. That's a good percentage. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, that opening night, we had 34 visitors. Oh, they'd never seen it like uh, that. No. <laughs> wow. They were excited, man. There's a church that wasn't ready. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. A church that wasn't. The next night, there was about 15 of the 20 members that were oh, there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they were there. And they were excited. They were blown away. And at the end of that series, we had 12 baptisms. 20 members. 12 baptisms. Twelve baptisms. The church didn't want to do it. They, they hadn't wanted to do it. So, and, uh, so what did this do for the church? What was the reaction? Oh, the reaction was phenomenal. You know, in fact, the meetings came to an end on a Saturday. The next day, I was delivering some of the videos that people had gotten of the seminar. Yep. And I, I was delivering to one of my neighbors. He was a farmer in the area. And uh, anyhow, he, was, uh, he wrote a check out for the videos. And we, we had come up about $5,000 short for the entire cost of the meeting. Which meant you and Jana were going to have to pull $5,000 we out of your we, we figured, back pocket somehow. We figured we'd work out something. And, All uh, right. Anyway, he writes a check for the videos, and then he flips his checkbook, and he writes out a check for $8,000. Come on. I'm not kidding. Really? <laughs> wow. And that week, when I went back and we met with the church for our, our board meeting, our treasurer had tears in her eyes when I handed her the check. And, uh, and the church began to say to me, we got to do this again. Oh, they want to do it again? We need to do this again. And Fantastic. I, and I said, yeah. yeah, I said, you're, you're right. We need to do it again. Uh, let's begin planning for it next year. And they said, next year? We can't, we can't wait till next year. Come on. And uh, so we didn't. Guess what? What? Five months later, we had another series of meetings. Lyle Albrecht. Yes, you. Sure. did a series of meetings. Lyle's an inveterate 
I mean, campaigner, held so many meetings. <laughs> That's right. And Great five, five months later, we had another series. Yeah. 19 more baptisms. No way. 19 more baptisms. So tw 12 and then five months later, 19. And it was all in the same year. Fantastic. And so, you know what? God had a, and after that, that was it. I had to get out of the way. The church was on it. They said, we got to grow. And evangelism became a part of the cycle. Beautiful. In fact, the church grew to the point where we had to build a whole new building. Fantastic. How's the church doing today? Good. Yeah, really. Doing good. I was at a, uh, a camp meeting in another part of the country, and they played a video by a man who was a, a, the lay leader in the church, an elder in the church. Mm -hmm. And he said, my pastor wanted to do evangelistic meetings. I was against it. I don't have nothing to do with it. But the meetings went ahead, and I started to attend. And I saw what God was doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm convinced That's right. this is what we got to be doing. He, the man is in boots and all. Really? So I don't know how it is that people get educated against public evangelism. But man, don't we need to be telling people this works? Of course, you're going to have disappointing meetings. Mm -hmm. Of course you are. You've got to plan well. You've got to execute well. You've got to pray. The church members need to be involved. There are some factors you need. That's right. That's right. But, but Jesus never said there's no one to save. He said the harvest is great. That's right. Problem is the labor is a few. You know, one of the things that I, that I discovered, because, John, I pastored for 23 years before I began full-time public evangelism myself. Yeah. And so I, I guess my heart resonates with the pastor. Sure, sure, sure. Mine and, too. Uh, yeah. you know, but one of the things that I think, and I had to learn this, I learned this the hard way, is, you know, you do a series of meetings, and we used to call them in the olden days an effort. Yeah, sure. It takes a lot of effort. You know? That's right. <laughs> and when it's over, you're kind of, you know, and then we think, all right, we're good to go for a few years. Don't make that mistake. I'll tell you, one of the biggest things I learned, and I had never done two series of meetings until that period of time. But I learned that when we had two series in a year, the second series, we always had greater results than the first one. Because the people that come in in the first meeting, they've got a whole bunch of friends. That's right. And they want to share it. Yeah. So why wait until that fire begins to, to wane Let's get them excited. Yeah. yeah. I, I held a series of meetings in a, in a, in a city and um, great church, fantastic church. And, and the pastors there said, we need meetings. So I came in and we held meetings. We had a Bible worker working for us. And this guy trained the church members, did a great job. There was a good number of people baptized. He put them straight into a class. And the, the Sabbath school class was uh, how, to, how to win people to Christ. Right he didn't tell them it was a Bible work training <laughs> class. He said, this is just what we do. So they said, okay, yep. Yeah, that's right. And he said, I, that's he, am going to hold a series. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I thought to myself, oh, no. <laughs> this guy can't preach. <laughs> and I didn't say that critically. I knew he couldn't preach. Okay. And I thought, this is going to be, well, thank God there's a God. That's you right. just never know. You know. That series that was held, the second series, mm -hmm. by a young man holding his first mm -hmm. ever series of meetings, had greater results in every way than the series held by the professional. Wow. Wow. It was a great result. That's right. He just yeah. said, let's do it again. And all those people who were baptized before, they became his people. Bible workers That's right. for the next meeting. Unashamed, man. They're yeah. excited. That's They're right. on fire. Oh, yeah. We got, we got to share this message. And if they catch it in that first year... They don't, they'll never lose it. That's right. It sets the path for their future life and ministry. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. We've got more to talk about. He is Donovan Keck and it is written affiliated evangelist. I'm John Bradshaw. More in a moment. This is Conversations. Hi, I'm John Bradshaw from It Is Written. The It Is Written Bible studies have been used around the world by people who want to understand the Bible better. They're short, they're easy to use, and they're life-changing. And in them, you'll find the hope and the peace that you